John Fitzgerald Kennedy was born on May 29, 1917, in Brooklyn, Massachusetts. His parents were Joseph and Rose Kennedy. He had eight brothers and sisters. JFK graduated from Harvard University in 1940. Also, he joined the Navy a year after that, but suffered a spinal injury in the war. Kennedy entered politics in 1946 and was elected to Congress. On September 12, 1953, he was married to his spouse, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. He had four kids, Caroline Kennedy, John F. Kennedy Jr., Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, and Arabella Kennedy. In 1957, JFK won the Pulitzer Prize for his book, Profiles and Courage. Once his campaign started to run for presidency, his opponent was Richard Nixon, a Republican. Also, his vice president was Lyndon B. Politics in 1946 and was elected to Congress. On September 12, 1953, he was married to his spouse, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. He had four kids, Caroline Kennedy, John F. Kennedy Jr., Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, and Arabella Kennedy. In 1957, JFK won the Pulitzer Prize for his book, Profiles Very often you'll find a Once zipper hidden in the uh, arm. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You'll excuse the fact that I'm out of breath, but about 10 or 15 minutes ago, a tragic thing from all indications at this point has happened in the city of Dallas. Let me quote to you this. And I'll, you'll excuse me if I am out of breath. A bulletin. This is from the United Press from Dallas. President Kennedy and Governor John Colony have been cut down by assassin's bullets in downtown Dallas. They were riding in an open automobile when the shots were fired. The president, his limp body carried in the arms of his wife, Jacqueline, has rushed to Parkland Hospital. Uh, and if you'll excuse me if I give some directions and we talk about what we're going to do here for the next few minutes. But, Bobby, let's tape this, if you please, particularly the interview with the eyewitness people. It is being taped good. Here's a uh, piece of copy that was rushed uh, to me and was torn off from the United Press in Dallas. President Kenny has been shot in Dallas, has been shot in Dallas, Texas. He was shot as a motorcade left downtown Dallas. Mrs. Kennedy jumped up and grabbed the president. She cried, oh no, as the motorcade sped on. An Associated Press photographer, James Algins, 8-L-T-G-E-N-S, reports he saw blood on the president's head. The AP man said he heard two shots but thought someone was shooting fireworks until he saw the blood on the president. He also said he saw no one. during your presidency? Um, that's a good question. Um, I want to improve our relations with Latin America through peaceful economic cooperation and development, which would also inhibit their communist-leaning insurgents, such as Fidel Castro. I would also like to loan more than $20 million to Latin American countries to promote de democracy. And all forms of human life. And yet the same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. We dare not forget today that we are the heirs of that first revolution. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. That thoughts about black civil rights? Um, well, when Martin Luther King Jr., when he was arrested, um, I called Coretta Scott King to show my support in the release of her husband. And after that, I have appointed many African Americans to high-ranking positions to strengthen the civil rights 
Commission. ...of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. This much we pledge and more. To those old allies whose cultural and spiritual origins we share, we pledge the loyalty of faithful friends. United, there is little we cannot do in a host of cooperative ventures. Divided, there is little we can do. For we dare not meet a powerful challenge at odds and split asunder. To those new states whom we welcome to the ranks of the free, we pledge our word that one form of colonial control shall not have passed away merely to be replaced by a far more iron tyranny. We shall not always expect to find them supporting our view, but we shall always hope to find them strongly supporting their own freedom and to remember that in the past those who foolishly sought power by riding the back of the tiger ended up inside. <laughs> to those people in the huts and villages of half the globe struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves. For whatever period is required, not because the communists may... At this time, I have the honor to present to you the moral leader of our nation. I have the pleasure to present to you Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. <laughs> Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still 
is not free. One hundred years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, the, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize the shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men. Direct from our newsroom in Washington, in color, this is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and Russ Hodge in Memphis, Tennessee, Dan Rather in New York, Bernard Kalb in Saigon, Marvin Kalb in Wellington, New Zealand, and Bert Quint in Khe Sanh, South Vietnam. Good evening. Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. Police have issued an all-points bulletin for a well-dressed young white man seen running from the scene. Officers also reportedly chased and fired on a radio-equipped car containing two white men. Dr. King was standing on the balcony of a second-floor hotel room tonight when, according to a companion, a shot was fired from across the street. In the friend's words, the bullet exploded in his face. Police, who have been keeping a close watch over the Nobel Peace Prize winner because of Memphis' turbulent racial situation, were on the scene almost immediately. They rushed the 39-year-old Negro leader to a hospital where he died of a bullet wound in the neck. Police said they found a high-powered hunting rifle about a block from the hotel, but it was not immediately identified as the murder weapon. Mayor Henry Loeb has reinstated the dusk-to-dawn curfew he imposed on the city last week when a march led by Dr. King erupted in violence. Governor Buford Ellington has called out 4,000 National Guardsmen, and police report that the murder has touched off sporadic acts of violence in a Negro section of the city. In a nationwide television address, President Johnson expressed the nation's shock. America is shocked and saddened by the brutal slaying tonight of Dr. Martin Luther King. I ask every citizen to reject the blind violence that has struck Dr. King, who lived by nonviolence. Dr. King had returned to Memphis only yesterday, determined to prove that he could lead a peaceful mass march in support of striking sanitation workers, most of whom are Negroes. Dr. King had this to say last night about the situation in Memphis. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read, of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. There was shock in Harlem tonight when word of Dr. King's murder reached the nation's largest Negro community. Men, women, and children poured into the streets. They appeared dazed. Many were crying. A young Negro said, Dr. King didn't really have to go back to Memphis. Maybe he wanted to prove something. 